so I'm told that if you hang out in screenwriting circles for long enough, you are likely to encounter the phrase, save the cat. This was a concept popularized by Blake Snyder in his book entitled Save the Cat. And while not always used in the context of a literal cat, it refers to the tried and true method of endearing your hero to the audience by allowing him to see him save a helpless critter when there wasn't necessarily something in it for him. While Snyder's book and thereby widespread knowledge of the Save the Cat phenomenon has only been around since about 2005, at least as early as 1950, renowned writer and gay icon Truman Capote was able to challenge audience expectations by requiring his readers to ponder a question seldom asked of a male protagonist. And that question is, what does the hero do when the cat does not want or need saving? A question that prompted the heterosexual men of Hollywood land to lose their minds a few years later and collectively cry out, but you didn't save the cat, Mr. Capote. I think we all know you meant to save the cat. Did I? Of course you did. We can't have women, uh, cats go around unsaved. Let us fix it for you, Mr. Capote. For how much, boys? Salutations, fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones, and when I say the words Manic Pixie Dream Girl, any number of fictional females probably comes to your mind. From literal pixies, to newborn badasses, to hookers with hearts of gold, and many, many others. This phrase was first used by film critic Nathan Rabin to describe the Kirsten Dunst character in Elizabethtown, along with the observation that said dream girl, quote, exists solely in the fevered imaginations of sensitive writer-directors to teach broodingly soulful young men to embrace life and its infinite mysteries and adventures. But despite this phrase achieving popularity in the mid-2000s, just about every Manic Pixie Dream Girl I can think of was inspired directly or in part by Audrey Hepburn, specifically Hepburn's portrayal of Holly Golightly in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Like its movie adaptation, point of view character in Breakfast at Tiffany's the novella is this guy, who lives in the same building as Holly, and as a result of being one of the poor devils who sometimes gets to let her in when she loses her keys at 3 a.m., our nameless narrator gets to know Holly's schedule pretty well. Also, like the movie, Holly calls the narrator Fred because he reminds her of her brother. Also, also like the movie, Holly lives out of suitcases, shares her apartment with a big orange cat aptly named Cat, and makes her money by letting a lot of men think they are her sweetheart, only to later find she is a turner of very expensive tricks. And despite the book weighing in at a paltry 110 pages, the descriptions Capote uses are evocative and memorable. My favorite might be that of Mag Wildwood, Holly's occasional frenemy. She was a triumph over ugliness, so often more beguiling than real beauty, if only because it contains a paradox. Heels that emphasized her height, so steep her ankles trembled. A flat, tight bodice that indicated she could go to the beach in bathing trunks. Hair that was pulled straight back, accentuating the sparseness and the starvation of her fashion model face. Turns of phrase such as these doubtlessly played a part in the casting of excellent character actors to fill Capote's New York for the Breakfast at Tiffany's movie, and the only gaffe in the nigh-unto-perfect casting may be Mickey Rooney as the photographer, which... You know what? Let's come back to the photographer. For now, suffice it to say that the differences between the book and the movie are numerous as well. Like, the narrator is not a kept man posing as a writer-in-residence who finds his muse in Holly, but an actively struggling writer who finds a semi-welcome distraction in Holly. Neither she nor the nameless narrator are unambiguously heterosexual, either. If I were free to choose from everybody alive, just snap my fingers and say, come here, you, I wouldn't pick Jose. Nauru is nearer to the mark. Wendell Wilkie? I'd settle for Greta Garbo any day. Why not? A person ought to be able to marry men or women or... Listen, if you came to me and said you wanted to hitch up with Man of War, I'd respect your feeling. No, I'm serious. Love should be allowed. I'm all for it. Also, as written by Capote, Holly is only 19 years old, while the movie ages her up quite a bit, and thoroughly sanitizes everything regarding the risks of Holly's lifestyle, including any and all talk of pregnancy or STDs. Outrageous racial stereotypes, on the other hand, are fine, says Men of Hollywood circa 1961. Spoilers, it's not fine, but we'll get there. The thing is, though, the novella was not set in madcap 1960s-era New York. It was set in wartime 1940s New York, which gives certain details from the movie a completely different feel, if not a downright ominous one. Brother Fred's being in the army, for example, has a greater urgency to it. Holly's entertaining a multitude of troops means she is likely the girl back home for about a thousand guys, as evidenced by the bales of highly censored mail she gets from day to day. 
and the fact that she's snuggling up to Brazilian despots and millionaire man-babies who go around saying things like Hitler was right from time to time sets off a completely different set of alarm bells. You know how Nazis in Argentina go together in the public library of overused punchlines like guess what's and chicken butts? Well, Brazil was pretty chill about accepting Nazi expats and war criminals as well. Like, to this day, you'll be minding your own business, trying to muddle your way through the country on your limited Portuguese, and suddenly there'll be a German word, or the name of a settlement with one too many Ks in it, and the locals will plainly tell you, yeah, that's where a bunch of Germans settled after the war. Seriously, the letter K did not exist in the Brazilian Portuguese alphabet until the Nazis got there. Isn't that something? But I digress. The point is, Holly and her homegirls have no problem making time for fascists if they see in those fascists a reliable meal ticket. And, like, hunger makes you do weird things. I would not want to trade problems with those girls, but damn. While we're in the neighborhood of Yikes City, USA, you'll notice I didn't actively recommend this book for anyone's Pride Month read, despite its brief length and my own personal conviction that it is an important story relevant to how we read and interpret a lot of stories that came after it. The reason I'm not recommending Breakfast at Tiffany's to everyone is because the writing and characters have all of the racial and queer sensitivity you'd expect from white teenagers in the 1940s. So I can't actually encourage or discourage anyone from exposing themselves to that kind of potentially hurtful vocabulary. It's kind of a gut punch even when you know the hateful words are there, and despite the fact that it probably would have been ordinary at the time the story was written. And while we're here, now is as good a time as any to chat about Mr. Uniyashi here. See, while he is a legitimate photographer in the book, it is also made a bit clearer when he and Holly have this conversation. Don't be angry, you dear little man. I won't do it again. If you promise not to be angry, I might let you take those pictures we mentioned. Please? Sometime. Anytime. They are talking about dirty pictures. And again, for most of this book, Holly is only 19 years old. 18 years old at the start of it. In 1940s America, she would not legally be an adult till age 21. That is also presumably why she could not change her last name after she left Mr. Golightly, the horse doctor in his 50s who married Holly when she was only 14 years old. You know, that awkward time in a girl's life where she shouldn't legally be able to consent to marriage but definitely can't legally consent to a divorce. Yeah, I believe we just hit downtown Yike City during rush hour. Let's back up a little bit. While the casting of the very white Mickey Rooney in Yellow Face as the Japanese photographer is, wonder of wonders, not the best call the filmmakers could have made, the other options would have been to whitewash the character, remove the character, or make one of the only named characters of color a child pornographer. And you know what? I am too pale to have an opinion worth listening to on which of those options is the worst one. All I can do is let you know they are there, and proceed to a topic on which I can speak with authority. And that is The Cat That Needs No Saving. I first saw this movie after a full three decades of hearing rave reviews about it from people I respected. And when I finally saw it, I felt at the time like it was about 80% good movie, but the ending felt disgusting to me in a way I had a hard time putting into words. Then on reading the book, I found one of a couple consistent and pervasive themes is Holly's kinship with animals, reflected poorly by the movie in its treatment of birds and cats. Birds and cats, birds and cats, and birds and cats. For example, toward the climax of either story, Holly rather roughly sets the cat free in the rain. The nameless narrator sits in a car with Holly trying to talk her out of leaving New York City. But at the end of their talk in the book, the narrator promises a tearful Holly he will look for the cat on her behalf, in the knowledge that Holly may be leaving for good, and she has given both the cat and him as much love as she was capable of giving. After Holly leaves, our narrator not only looks for the cat, he finds some weeks later that the cat is fat and happy, having been adopted by someone amazing and leading his best life, leaving the narrator with some unpleasant growing up to do, i.e. the horribly mature task of accepting that both Holly and the cat will be fine without him. Whereas in the movie, the male protagonist bullies Holly both into staying in New York and cishet conformity because... I love you. You belong to me. No. People don't belong to people. Of course they do. I'm not gonna let anyone put me in a cage. You know what's wrong with you, miss, whoever you are? You're afraid to stick out your chin and say, okay, life's a fact. People do fall in love. People do belong to each other. Because that's the only chance anybody's got for real happiness. And you're terrified somebody's going to stick you in a cage. Well, baby, you're already in that cage. You built it yourself. It's wherever you go. Because no matter where you run, you just end up running into yourself. And 
Holly and the cat are saved, whether they want to be or not. Oh, how we will celebrate. And in the writing of my script for this video, I tried to start my wrap-up here, talking about how my struggle with Breakfast at Tiffany's was a personal one, that it was not total garbage like Pretty Woman had been. That Breakfast at Tiffany's is a classic for a reason, and if you love it, please keep doing so. Then I remembered this scene through the lens of book knowledge and the eyes of an editor and went, Hold it. Why is there a birdcage in Holly's apartment? Because the cage is in the book as well, and it is used as a very expensive metaphor. Specifically, our protagonist goes on an outing with Holly, during which he shows her a $300 Taj Mahal of birdcages. That's a six and a half thousand dollar birdcage in 2023 money, expecting her to be impressed. And all Holly can say is, it's still a cage. Later, at Christmas time, Holly hustles a little bit extra and gives her friend this same birdcage, but makes him promise never to put a living creature in it. Holly can't even walk past the Central Park Zoo and will take the long way around because she cannot deal with seeing anything in a cage. I know you know this, George Axelrod and Blake Edwards or your team, and you would not have added the granular detail from the book to your movie, like Holly's understated gray sweaters, or Rusty's baby buttock face, or the guitar scene on the fire escape, or the stealing of the Halloween masks from the Five and Dime. So the fact that Holly's apartment is now casually decorated with a birdcage could be an innocent misremembering of details. But for as strong a theme as Holly's contempt for cages was in the book, it certainly feels to me like a deliberate change, and like the movie has just told us without words. It's a birdcage audience. That's where the bird belongs. And I couldn't get this detail out of my head. Why is there a birdcage in Holly's apartment? Movie makers don't just point a camera at ready-made scenery and go, oops, amazing. They try really hard not to accidentally leave things on set that don't serve the story they are telling. So the odds are astonishingly strong that the reason there is a birdcage in Holly's apartment is because someone put it there. Then I started noticing other things they put there, like Holly voluntarily kissing the narrator multiple times in the movie, whereas he tried to kiss her once in the book and she dodged. Or the movie's point of view character giving himself a name, then whining about how no one remembers it. Whereas in the book, the narrator never mentions his own name, almost like it wasn't important compared with Holly's name. Or how about the fact that the Holly of the book is easily the sweetest, most disarming drunk in history, Whereas in the movie, she's not only belligerent, but stage directed to be on the floor of her apartment, allowing the saintly, sober narrative to literally look down on her. And just, wow, movie, that was unintentionally amazing. I didn't know you could play Moon River on a dog whistle, did you? And the thing is, Mr. Capote himself explains most people's feelings toward their manic pixie dream girls really well. At any rate, she no longer rang my bell. I missed that. And as the days merged, I began to feel toward her certain far-fetched resentments, as if I were being neglected by my closest friend. A disquieting loneliness came into my life, but it induced no hunger for friends of longer acquaintance. They seemed now like a salt-free, sugarless diet. But Capote doesn't let his narrator dwell on those feelings for the duration of the story, because it wouldn't be good for the narrator and it wouldn't be fair to Holly. See, The Breakfast at Tiffany's movie is largely seen as a chick flick now, but no one should love this movie more than cishet white guys, because the makers of the movie prioritize saving the cat slash girl and bolstering the man's fragile ego at every turn, where Mr. Capote prioritized the man's acceptance of loss and his personal growth. Like, I really truly get it, buddy. No one wants to see Holly go to Brazil. No one in history on Earth wants to be the nameless narrator watching the girl of his dreams vanish, knowing she'll be okay without him and burdened with the emotional labor of learning to be okay without her. But if your characters never do that, you end up with two, and only two kinds of male protagonists in pursuit of the manic pixie dream girl. Those who are outclassed by her in every way but still end up with her at the end because audience expectations or something. Or those who are painted as love's own martyr for fearlessly loving a wild animal who ran away never knowing that what she really wanted was right in front of her. Cute boys. Better circle jerk counterclockwise now and then or you'll never point true north again. Like, seriously, if we're honest, how many movies featuring a Holly clone have the minerals to show their male protagonist the kind of tough love that Truman Capote showed his? Mm, we did it, Zack. Now Hexus can never harm Fern Gully again. But humans still could. That's why I have to go back. Really? That's the only one we can think of? What was done, now undo. Return you to the form. That's true. Isaac. You know what? Sure. 
Fred Gully is the new gold standard for Manic Pixie Dream Girls and the men who love them. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. If you are interested in more videos wherein sexism ruins everything, consider giving this one a shot. Meantime, take it easy. Loves you. Bye. Hey, where are you going?